Matt, welcome back to the program here. I want to ask you about what things look like immediately after the Democratic National Convention. Obviously, Kamala Harris, Tim Walz will get a convention boost like Donald Trump did after Milwaukee. What do Republicans do differently now, if anything, in Texas? Yeah, look, I think uh, the, the question now is, um, is has, has Harris's kind of free ride come to an end? Is the rise that she's had over six weeks, which has been meteoric, um, is that now going to be sustained by anything that's real? Um, this race now, as we get closer to Labor Day, really becomes about issues um, and it becomes about the things that matter most to voters. Uh, the Democrats did a good job introducing her of having this unprecedented switch of pulling off a convention that attracted a large TV audience of having some impressive performances. I think the challenge the Dems have now is two things. One, uh, if she has so many good ideas about how to make things better, why hasn't they been doing that for three years? But but two is, you know, what are her policy ideas going to be? Why has her opinion changed on so many things? Uh, and when is she going to start answering actual questions? She's gone something like 30 days without receiving one adversarial question from ever the media. So uh, for, for the Trump team, uh, they need to make this race about the economy and about immigration. And if they do that, they're going to win. Uh, if this is about personalities, it's about looking backwards. If it's about abortion, then Harris has a chance to win. And I think the stakes almost have never been higher in a national election at any time in my life. Well, what do you expect this to look like, a, a race on personalities or a, a race on policy? Yeah, I mean, the Dems are trying to make it about personality. You know, they, they, they're running on, on joy, whatever that means. Um, I don't think a lot of Americans are, are feeling joy about the state of the country right now. Um, but that's what that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to make it a personality battle. And look, Donald Trump's strengths and weaknesses, I think, are well understood by 100 percent of the people that live in America. Uh, you know, it's all been baked into the cake. It's all been priced into the stock. It's really not about who you like better. It's really about did you like the Trump presidency better or did you like the Biden Harris administration four year period better? What was better for you? What was better for your family? What made you feel more secure? What made you feel like you have more of an economic opportunity? Uh, and that's, again, the frame that I think Trump has to get back to. And I think as we lead into this televised debate, uh, the stakes are going to be very high for that, too. Can Harris sustain a 90 minute debate and get into substance, explain her position changes and her record and her vision and her policy ideas? Uh, can Trump, uh, you know, make the case against her, but do it in a way that doesn't turn off female voters, which is challenging when you're going up against a female in a televised debate setting. So, um, look, this race is not settled. What has happened is Kamala Harris has, has brought back uh, the Democrats from the abyss with all the uh, leakage that was happening after the, the first debate with Biden. Uh, the, the, we have seven states that are going to determine this thing, Pennsylvania being the largest uh, crown jewel in that whole list. Uh, but I think the debate is really going to going to make clear what this race is about, what the choice is before the voters. And it's a moment where both of them have to rise to the, to the challenge. Well, let's talk about the debate for a moment. Obviously, national conventions are, are, are huge, splashy political productions, but debates are unscripted moments when you have candidate v. candidate here on stage and, and their, their uh, campaigns and their parties can do nothing at that point to help them. How important do you expect the debate to be on September the 10th? I think it'd be really important because um, much more so for Kamala Harris than for Trump. And the reason I say that is this is really her first major test. The only other test she's had is when she named her vice presidential choice. And, and, and she didn't really make, I think, the smart political choice of choosing the popular governor of Pennsylvania. She chose the, the most liberal governor of Minnesota and really was, I think, bullied into that by the liberal base and perhaps by concern about picking a Jewish American as a vice president. So um, this is really the first test she's going to face. She did do a vice presidential debate against Mike Pence uh, four years ago. I don't remember that being all that consequential. This is different. And Trump is a different opponent. It's also an, uh, important for Trump. He's got to get away from the things that people don't like about him personally and get back to the record, get back to growing the economy, unleashing American energy, getting the border under control. Uh, this sense that we can we can turn a country around. Uh, he did it uh, in, in 2016 when he came into office. COVID uh, made the end of his term very difficult. We've now had four very difficult years for most Americans. He has to make clear that he has an optimistic, positive vision for the future and that he can actually execute it and contrast that with Harris's past statements, her record the last four years and what she's proposing now. What do Texas Republicans make of the Democratic National Convention? Because by, by all you know measurements here, this has been a huge success for Democrats. I, going back, I can't think of a time in, in the past decade or so that Democrats have been this enthusiastic about anyone. It's 2008 for Barack Obama was the last time. Before that, it was 1992 for Bill Clinton. Yeah, there are some there are some similarities to the 2008 time frame. Um, and I think for, for, for Democrats, they, they love the idea of having a black female leader ticket. I think they're also just really enthusiastic about the idea of not having Biden, uh, given how challenging his candidacy had become. 
Uh, and look, they def desperately want to stop Trump. And it became increasingly clear Biden was uh, unable or incapable of doing that. Uh, but look, they've all been swept up in this uh, six week free ride she's had where she hasn't had the answer questions, hasn't had to tell anything about policy, doesn't even have a policy site on her website. So, again, all that's coming to an end. When Labor Day comes around, voters start paying attention. Campaigns start spending real money. Debates happen. Things change. And the race is going to settle. This is still going to come down to seven states. It's probably going to come down to two or three states. It's probably going to come down to 15 counties in two or three states. And you're 15, talking about fifteen again, counties in a few yep, states. Yeah, yeah. You're talking about you know the urban and the suburban large area, large counties in Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Michigan. You could really just start there. Keep in mind, if Trump wins Pennsylvania, and Kamala Harris wins Arizona, Nevada, Wisconsin, Michigan, Trump still wins 270, 268. That is how important Pennsylvania is, right? She can flip four battleground states and still come up short. So I think to some extent, Pennsylvania is going to simplify this for all of us. If Trump wins Pennsylvania, it's very hard for him to lose. If she wins Pennsylvania he's going to have to put some of the states together and create other pathways. Matt, what else are you specifically watching for besides the debate as we go into the last few months here? Yeah, look, I mean, the battle for the U.S. Senate is really crucial. Um, Republicans seem to pick up two seats. They've done a great job recruiting. They have, I think, a, a win at their back in West Virginia, certainly in Montana, Maryland, Wisconsin. Uh, we have an important U.S. Senate race in Texas, which I, which I think has been kind of sleepy in some ways. Uh, Colin Allred has spent much, most of the summer really kind of out of vision, not really doing very much that, that people can see. And there's been some angst on the left about that. Um, you know, in Texas, obviously, we're very interested in, in the makeup of the Texas House. We're very interested in an important uh, statewide race for Supreme Court and for Railroad Commission. Uh, but, but at the national level, look, the presidential just dominates everything. And it affects the control for the House. It controls majority control of the Senate. Uh, control, controls uh, you know, governorships down ballot and, and state houses and all kinds of things. And so the presidential is the behemoth and it is a very consequential presidential election, no question. Before we go and I ask you about the largest race in Texas, Ted Cruz versus Colin Allred, how does this shake out with two months left? Yeah, look, Allred's going to put $100 million into this thing and hard and soft money. Um, and, you know, on paper, I think he has the chance to be an interesting candidate. It really hasn't really come together the way I thought it would. And I think the fact that now Kamala Harris is the nominee. I don't think she's going to close the gap in Texas. I think Trump will win Texas by more than he did in 2020, which was 5.7%. I think he's actually going to expand that. And if that happens, there's no pathway for Allred to win. But look, Cruz is running very hard. He's running very scared. He's working uh, every single minute of the day. His schedule is absolutely insane. Uh, and that race is going to get a lot of attention. And it's really the only pickup opportunity the Democrats have in the map in, in, in 2024. And so they are going to put significant resources into Texas but so far, Allred has not made the sale. He's got to find Trump voters who will vote for Allred, and that's a very difficult task. Matt, good to see you. Thanks, man. Thanks. God bless.